Thank you everybody for coming today. Welcome to UP Design. My name is Jose Siano. I'll be your host for today. And today we're going to be learning about UI UX prototyping. And this is going to be using the software Adobe XD. We'll go into it near the end and we'll show you a bit how to use it. This is a multi-part uh, series. The next part will be an internal event for members of UPE Design. You'll get a heads up on that when it happens. So let's go right into it. <clears throat> what is UI UX? Many people may think that UI UX are kind of like the same thing, especially since you know people usually say just UI UX. But uh, there's actually a big difference between the two, where UI UX refers or UI, which is user interface. It's more of uh, the interface design. And user experience is just analyzing the, the way that a user, the end, the end user of your product will be experiencing the website, kind of like the flow of how everything will go. So user experience, they, this works in tandem with the UI guys, where they're going to identify and solve any of the problems that the user may experience. And they're responsible for creating the visual mapping skeleton of the product where you're going to establish the overall feel and experience of the user from start to finish. So the user interface design, on the other hand, remember these guys work in tandem with UX, where they these guys are responsible for research of implementation. They're going to be designing the buttons or the headers and the way that the components that will be used in the overall a page. They want to make sure that the end product is something that's pretty intuitive and something that when the user sees it, it's easy to understand and easy to use and something they like to use. So the big question they always think of is more, how will the overall product look versus the user experience direct designers who will be thinking, how does it feel? So with user experience, there is a a triad of ideologies that uh, are thought of as they go through their process. This relies around the three fundamentals of usability, which is how easy is it to use? Learnability, how easy is it to, to learn from a user standpoint? And desirability, does somebody want to use it? So the best way to think about it is usability is, is kind of like tools. You want to use something that's very simple to use, simple to pick up, anybody can, can use it without any hard learning curve. Learnability is, again, it it's ties into it where how easy is it to learn? If I was to just pick it up as a random person today, will I be able to get going with it right away? And desirability, you can think about it as food where you can have the most delicious food there is, but nobody will eat it if it doesn't look good. And it's the same idea. Nobody will use your product if the users don't like it, how it looks. So the overall UX process is uh, this big cycle where you're going to be doing research, design, implementation, and reporting. So, and so to, oh, what happened with this slide? So the process also involves a ton of research, a ton of beta testing, the creation of user personas, and the creation of site mappings. All of this will go into in these sections. So user tests, these are essentially, as you go through your process, you want to improve on the original design. You know, maybe as your product was getting used, maybe you found from research that the, some of the pages didn't flow as well. Some of the pages maybe you could get rid of, some components you can move around. Maybe you can add some extra fields or add some extra information in certain areas. This is the kind of stuff that you'll learn from testing. So it's useful for eliminating any problems or unforeseen user issues like uh, was, was just mentioned. And the ways you can find out the information from these and is to create these tests is through, you know, observing just how the product is and how users are, are feeling with it. Questionnaires, you know, in surveys, ask, always ask. You want to always make sure they're involved and that you're able to put their opinions and thought at the forefront of your uh, at basically revisions. User personas. These are very important in the process because 
especially early on, you may not have the ability to easily get the frame of mind of every user that you're going to be, that's going to be using your product. So a persona is basically a detailed example that you and the team can work with. They're very useful for getting in the right mindset and trying to understand the motives and train of thought that the users will have as they go through the process of uh, going through your website or application. So to create a persona, it's very important to understand the kind of market you're going for. You wanna have a good idea of your target demographic. And that also includes finding realistic data that you can model your personas after, like John Doe, age 25, he works in uh, London. You also want to make sure you give them detailed goals and motivations. You know, what's his job? What's his, what's his goals? What's his hobbies? Those are the kind of things you want to think about when you're creating a persona. And site mappings, these are a good visual representation of the outline of your product. They may be like uh, user diagrams or uh, maybe even wireframes where they're useful to helping you plan and establish the location of content. So you can see how accessible is it? Does everything flow well? Because when, especially when you're working with multi-page applications, for example, it can be very easy to just forget about how everything is supposed to flow when you get caught up in how it just looks. And brainstorming is a very important part of the UX process as you know, you have to think of the original uh, product, you have to think about how it feels and the overall design of it. So you can do that with user flow diagrams, which uh, they're a high level overview that takes you through the UI step-by-step -step on how the user will be seeing which pages. And we also have wireframes, which are rough sketches that uh, show the components and the UI makeup. Uh, these are also very helpful for the developers as it gives them an idea of what to, you know, make at the end. And you can see here, this is a nice user flow example where on the left, you see the user, they come in with the sign on, the sign in, and the arrows indicate which direction you will go after you are at the current component. So you see from login or sign up, you go to already signed up. And from there, you either go to enter email address or create a free account and register, depending on the uh, kind of user that's that's there. From there, you know, you would enter your password and from after that, you would be sent to this other component, this other page, where you can create a document and from here would keep going forward with all the different uh, ways that the user could uh, basically play with the website or application. Here you can see a wireframe, which is a just a mock-up of some kind of mobile application. And again, it relies on so, you know, certain images to establish what kind of content will be on the wireframe on that wireframe uh, page and arrows to indicate from, you know, where would you go from point A, where would you go? What would be your point B? And that is shown by these arrows that lead to other um, designs. So once you have created your wireframes, you would start working with implementation and this revolves around prototypes where you would create um, you know, low or high fidelity prototypes, where the low and high fidelity just means how in depth do the uh, prototypes look? Do they basically respond? Do they have the kind of colors and components that the, you want to pass to the web developers to make into the actual pro, uh, website or application? And like, as you can see in the second slide, it's very, and the second bullet point, it's very important for the front end and backend developers to know this kind of information as it, they will be, you know, making the actual prototype into an actual end product. So reporting is again, very important as it's a diagram to outline the steps the user might take as they go through the UI. Split testing is again, very important in reporting. It helps you test as you're uh, iterating from your basically testing phase is gonna let you see how effective is this new iteration? Do we need to change something? Do we need to go back? Can we keep going further? That's the kind of stuff you're gonna see with split testing. And analytics reporting is again, very important to get the user's opinions and how they feel about the product so that you can get um, basically a, useful, a good idea of what may need to be improved or if you're going on the right train of thought. 
<clears throat> so with uh, UX, these are the kind of things you will be doing in a job as a UX designer, where you will have to do, you know, a lot of people skills. You will have to know how to uh, present, pitch, and showcase your work. You're going to have to know how to gather user information in through research. This could involve a lot of traveling. Paperwork. Paperwork and documentation will be your best friend as everybody need, will rely on this kind of information to get along with the other steps of the development process. And this is not an individual job. There's a lot of group work and facilitating groups. You're gonna you know, have to work on a large team with a bunch of other UX designers, UI designers, and developers. All right, so let's play a little game here. This is called uh, Good Versus Bad, also known as you versus the designs you told you not to worry about. So on the left side, you can see uh, basically a sign-in form. And on the right side, you also see a sign-in form. There is one issue on the left side that kind of makes a bad UX design practice compared to the right side. And that is the incorrect password, where if you have an error, it's very important for the user to see it and for you to be explicit about it. Even though you on the inside, you know, on the inside as in on the team may have an idea of the kind of errors and all the information, the user using it, he doesn't know anything about that. He just knows that I sign in, I, t I type my information, I click sign in, I should sign in or I should not sign in. So that's an important uh, thing to keep to keep in the back of your mind as you're going through your de uh, designing practice. Remember to try and be explicit when you can. Here's another case where you can see two bodies of text and the main issue here is on the left side is that the margins do not really add up. It's kind of added, it's, it's a jarring effect with the eyes. As you see the title here, and you come down to the uh, basically subtext, and it's at a completely different location than what you were originally looking at. Whereas on the right side, everything flows pretty smoothly from the top header to the subtext and basically anything else that you would have. It's a good thing to keep in mind. You want to remember how you know your eyes look through the page, because that's how the user will also see it. Here's the last one. On the left side and on the right side, you'll see a totally not a social media followers page. And the big difference here is the closing marks, there's the rejection marks on the follow. So you need to remember, basically, this is more of just a ease of use, where on the left side, it's very hard to see and to possibly to click and thus decline somebody. Whereas on the right side, it's very large, it's very explicit for the user. And with how big it is, it's very easy for them to use. So again, this goes into that easeability that I mentioned earlier, where you want it to be easy for the users to use. So these are some of the popular UI UX tools. Um, Figma is an online web browser one. It's available for basically any any OS because it is a web is in web browser. Sketch is um, a downloaded software for Mac OS and Adobe XD is a downloaded software for Mac and Windows, which we will be using for these uh, workshops. So this will be provided um, in the slide deck where the link to Adobe XD to download. I'll also post it right now in the chat just in case you would download the starter plan. But with that, I'm going to take it now to Adobe XG to just give you a brief overview of it. So, you know, for the following, uh, for the following presentation, you guys will be, you know, a bit up to speed with it. Let me open in that. Okay, so when you first open Adobe XD, you'll see this, which is a basically a dashboard. And in here, you can see your recent activities. You can see, right now we're on home. You can see uh, this slide deck, which shows uh, some UI kits you could download. And UI kits are basically just a collection of pre-made assets that you could use in your website or, the, or application design. And here you can see the, these are called artboards. Artboards are, think of it as the canvas or the easel you're gonna be painting on and you, each artboard will represent a page. You'll see uh, in a second. I just also wanna show you this because this is also pretty helpful. 
There's also a learn tab, which will show you a bunch of tutorials that you could use to improve in Adobe XD. It's a pretty good heads up. But yeah, so again, you can click on here, any kind of these uh, artboards with, that will be made with different sizes. I'm gonna click on the web one that's gonna give us a 1920 by 1080 uh, artboard, which I don't have the learn tab. Ooh, I, uh, I don't know how to answer that one. But uh, I, uh, you can follow along if you want. Um, this will be recorded, so you can also just follow along in the recording if you want. But um, you'll see here, this is an artboard, which is, like I said, the page that you're going to be like designing. Think of it as like a painting if you want it to be a bit Bob Rossi. So you can uh, copy and paste them to create multiple just so you can have uh, different pages to work with because in case you're working with multi-page designs. And on the right side here with the artboard, you'll see the transform, which allows you to change the dimensions. Like let's say this page is supposed to scroll down and there's gonna be more information. I can change the height here and it's now 4,000. So now I can add more information on this artboard. Same thing with the width. Let's say I wanted to make it smaller for some reason, 1800, it's smaller. Go back. And the X, Y is just the coordinates on this plane that we're working with. How do I do the scroll thing? Um, you mean this? This? If you mean this, uh, you press control and you move um, your mouse wheel. If you mean this, you just press and hold the middle mouse. Oh, if you wanted to make the scroll thing on the transform tab on the right side, you just change the height to like whatever you want. And here, basically, you know, if you, usually the, pay, the screens is like, you know, 1920 by 1080, that's kind of like standard. But, you know, if you wanted to make the page bigger, like you scroll down, you would just add a bigger height and you would be able to add more content. <clears throat> uh, responsive resize. This is pretty helpful for keeping in mind that responsiveness is pretty important. Not everybody has the same um, screen size and people may come on the page from, you know, maybe a mobile device. So this is pretty important. It just lets um, you keep in mind when you're uh, designing here to have your assets be made in a way that is, you know, responsive. It changes size based on the, sc on the screen size. So we're going to keep working with just one artboard for now. So I'm just going to delete the other one. So on the left side, you'll see this, uh, Bunch of tools. So on the the first one is just the mouse. You'll you can kind of just click it and click and drag stuff wherever you want. The second one, up till this pen, they are what you call vector tools, where you can create uh, shapes by using vectors. Uh, I think there's somebody's on our uh, mic's unmuted right now. If you could mute, that'd be nice. Thank you. It's kind of a, what do you call it, a microphone echoing. So look, I'm going to create a rectangle, as you can see. And um, right now we'll just work with a rectangle. You can see here I can change the width and height and the x, y again. This works the same way as the when we were changing the artboard. You can do something called a flip, you know, horizontal or vertical, which just says, you know, literally just flip it on an axis. I'll show you it with a better shape instead of just a square. But uh, there's the opacity, which changes the general opacity of the object, as well as a blend mode, which uh, changes how the object looks in comparison to other stuff on the artboard. So for example, I can change it to color burn. That's, uh, for now, we'll just keep it on normal until I make it another color, how about that? Okay, so down here, this is the fill, which changes the color of the object. You can do it on a solid color, a gradient scale, where you see here we can play around where the start and the end of our gradient is. And here we can change the colors of our gradient. And we also have a radial gradient that does the same thing, but on a circular axis instead. And you can change the colors from the basically the menu here or the 
you put in the either the hex or the RGB code or the HSB code. And you can also change opacity of the color here. For now, let's just keep it like that. Um, border, this is the line. It's hard to see, but this is the, now it's easier to see. My mouse was a bit fucked, it's still doing it. Um, yes, yeah, so you can see here, this is the border, which is just the outline of the shape. You can change the size with the size. You can make it dashed if you want it to by putting a number and it will generate the size of the dash. And you can also add a gap. How, how big do you want the gap between the dashes? Like for example, let's make it 50. Now there's less dashes. Um, this outline, this border, you can change where it's positioned with these three. This is called inner stroke, where it's on the inside of the shape, as you see. If I clicked outer, outer stroke, it's now on the outside. And if I were to click center stroke, it does both. It's now in the center of basically the wrapping of the board. These are also, you know, some other ways you can play around with it. Basically changes the way the corners look, which is the, they're called joints. And these are also round caps, which just change how basically the border looks and interacts with the, itself. And you can also add shadows. So shadows are a pretty nice thing to see. It adds a little bit of layer into it. It makes it look a bit three-dimensional instead of just flat on the canvas. So with the shadow, you can change the X and Y position of the shadow as well as the blur. It's kind of hard to see right now. So let's turn up the blur, which would increase the overall uh, effect of the shadow as well as let's remove the color. Yeah and the border. So now you can see there's the outline of the shadow and it looks more like it's a card on top of a page instead of just being a square on a page. It's a bit three dimensional. It's a bit nice too. I like it. And you can also add a background blur. Uh, to do that, I'm gonna change this color again. I'm gonna add a nice background blur, which I haven't played around with much, but it's supposed to essentially background Give a blur of the background. You can play around with it with the opacity, the amount of blur, and the brightness. And you can mark it for export, which uh, is just saying, you know, what uh, what artboards or what components do you want to wrap up and export at the end of your project? You know, make a PDF, for example. So that's a rectangle. I can do it again with circles, which does the same thing, and triangles, and lines. This one's kind of hard to see, so let's make it a bit bigger, thick. So let me play around with this triangle here just to show you some of the other features that I said I would. So here you can see, I'm gonna flip it, flip it uh, vertically and I can add one more triangle inside of it. And now if I were to, and now I'm going to show you guys something cool. So I can show you how to flip. Uh, I want to show you guys how to flip horizontal looks. But to do that, I'm going to create my own custom object. And I can do that by going down here, going on the layers tab. And here you'll see all the objects that I just made. Like I'll see a polygon. I'll see polygon. I don't know what that one's there for, but I see the line I just made, another, this big triangle, the circle, and the rectangle. So if I were to control click on the whatever objects I wanted, so for example, let's take those two triangles, I can right click, click group. I just made a grouping, which just essentially creates a custom object and lets me look at this as if it was one object instead of two triangles. So now if I were to click it, and drag it, it moves as one. Whereas before, if I were to click it and drag it, they're separated. So let me just group them one more time. Okay, so now with this in mind, I have this triangle here. Let me show you a bit of the other tools now that I have a shape that actually like shows a bit more when you do stuff. Next to the transform, 
or on the transform section on the right side, there's a rotation, which lets me rotate the object around up to 360 degrees. So let's give this a nice 180, so it's upside down. And then let's give it a nice, like that. Okay, and now I'm gonna flip, flippy flip. And you see it's now flipping on the horizontal axis. So <clears throat> you can also change the corner count, which, <laughs> which allows you to basically change the amount of corners. Because note how it says this is a polygon not a triangle because now if I were to add eight, welcome to the octagon, uh, Dana White, where are you at? You can also add the radius of the corners. So if you don't want it rounded or if you don't want it the uh, hard uh, perpendicular to each other, you want a nice round corner. You can see I changed it and it's now a lot smoother, whereas before it's very rigid and hard. And you can also, let's see what else we can play with. Um, actually, I'm going to show you a bit extra from another object. You can click the text, which lets you add text to here, and you can change the, when you click on it, you can now change the text, basically. So it's now cyclic script. You can change it to Sitka. You can change the font size. You can change the font uh, style, and you can basically play around with a lot of how the overall text looks. You can also change the positioning. You can have it left aligned, right aligned, or center aligned. And again, you can also change how it looks. You can add a border, dirty color, and you can also add a shadow and black background blur. So basically, a lot of these uh, tools you can play with, they kind of have the same uh, ways that you can mod modify them. Some are just unique based on the fact that, you know, one's a text, one's an object, and so on. Another way, an, um, so with this grouping that I made here, I'll get back into this. Remember, groupings are just custom objects that I made. I just wanted to say that if I play around with this triangle, also move this octagon. If I want to add something to a group, an existing group, all I have to do is just drag it in there. And now text is in there. The ones on the bottom of the group, they're at the back of the background. And the ones on the top of the group, they're at the, they're at the foreground. So for example, the text right now is at the foreground. It can be seen here. If I were to move it under, you can't see it anymore. Uh, and here's a little proof of it. I'll change the opacity. And you can see now it's under the octagon because I Put it under it but if i were to put it back on top oh, we're good to go so that's some of the shapes and uh there's also a bunch of effects you can do with it you can do it too with these shapes like um let me just delete these and we're gonna play around with something a, a little valentine's day special you got a pen tool here which a pen you can create custom shapes by just click and dragging and playing around with the generated points. So you see a point, you click it, you can move it around. If you press um, Alt while you click it, or I forgot how to, uh... oh yes, you can also move it around. Uh, you, this object, you can fill it, you can add a shadow, you can add a background for it. But as I was saying, Gonna make a little nice little thing today. We're gonna uh, left click. It's okay. So yeah, if you shift left while you left click, you will be able to not just place a point but uh, round it out like so. so. Let's add a nice point there. Let's add a add a thing here. In here. Hey. Add a, add a thing here. Uh, add a thing here, and now I'll click back on the tool, and you can see that I can move, or click it, and move it around wherever I want. I can create a duplicate of this object by just Control C, Control V, copy pasting it, and you can see that I just created a second one of it right there. 
and let's flip it around. Let's connect the two and let's make it a nice object. And there you got like uh, a heart, I guess. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you see, and let's make this a nice, let's make this a nice linear gradient. Where Alt Shift can help drag a copy. Oh yes, Alt Shift, uh, that, that helps. Thank you, uh, Giancarlo. So we can add a fill to it by clicking, going here, going to our fill, coming here, and then let's also go on to the other side and let's fill it up with a nice gradient again. They're a bit different, but for now we'll work with it. You know, and I'm gonna show you something uh, a bit co called component state. So if I were to click on add, this added a state where this is the default state of it. Nothing is happening to it so far. But if I click uh, this plus here, I can click on hover states. And what this does, it's creating how the object will look when you hover over it with your mouse. I'll show you a bit in a second how to do that. So let's say it changes the color and it changes the color here. I don't know, he, he starts to feel, the person starts feeling blue a bit. So now what happens is you can click up here, which is desktop preview, which uh, anytime you want to see it, how it may look in, uh, what happened here? If you ever want to see how it may look you know, out, outside of just how you're developing it, you can come here and click, uh, desktop preview. I'm going to change my screen so I can do that. So we're going to click here and we're going to click. Oh, no, what happened here? Something wrong happened. Oh, it's because this is still, there we go. And now if I hover over it, it should do something. See, I hovered over it and it changes how it looks. You can do this with a bunch of other states. You could add, you know, like a button clicked and then you can simulate how the button will look when it's clicked. You can, you know, do more hover states like this. There's a bunch of ways you can play around with these tools. They're very helpful. That's why they're very helpful with uh, wire framing. And there's uh, like uh, here, you can click on the bottom where the layers was on top you can see basically this assets section, which shows you all the components that you made. Because this right now is a, this heart right now, you can see it's a component that we made and we added some state to it. If you had some, you know, character styling or custom colors, these will also show up here. But in this case, we didn't. It's just a quick go around to get you guys uh, on board with, show, with uh, playing around with Adobe XD. You can also click uh, share up top to basically create a link and you know if you want to show it around to people as this link you could but you could also click on the hamburger menu up top click save as or click export and you'll be able to export the artboards in this project so with that you know i hope this was a good way to get you playing around with adobe xd i'm going to bring it back to the slide deck now and as you can see, this is, uh, this is how UPE is, is with everybody. Got that nice heart going, you know, nice red and blue, maybe orange. But with that, we'll go back to the slide deck. So these are, again, going to be available in the slide deck. I'll post it a bit afterwards, or I'll post these links afterwards soon where there's a daily creative challenge. You know, it's a nice way to learn and uh, basically play around with Adobe because you can make something nice. You can also do daily UI challenges on websites like Daily UI. And there's a bunch of websites that have assets and guides. This one is uh, my favorite, UI Goodies. It shows uh, a bunch of assets and it, it shows you guides that you can learn with, but it also shows a bunch of assets you can use, like basically a color palette generator, um, icons that you can use uh, free, co no copyright, and that sort of uh, that good stuff. So with that, that's kind of the end of the presentation. If you guys have questions, you know, feel free. Now's the time. We'll be able to help out. If not, you know, 
Even you play around in Dolby XD, we'll see you at the next workshop. Put the learn on the version you have, like student or priced. Um, I think it could be, I'm not fully sure. I use, um, I, I was using the starter version, the starter version when you clicked on it. If you have Clubhouse, UI goodies and a bunch of other UI UX designers are sharing help. Yes, there's a bunch of websites. So, like, don't worry about like having to always think like I have to make my own custom components. A lot of times, no, you don't. What you need is probably already out there and it's free to use. You just have to look at, you just have to find the places to look for it. Oh, thank you, Anthony. Do you believe that learning Adobe XD is good skills for a front end designer? If you're a front end designer, yeah, because um, it's I think it'd be good. It's good to know the way your way around the uh the three that I mentioned: Adobe XD, Figma, and Sketch. Um, Sketch, like I said, is Mac dependent. Adobe XD is good for both. Um, Figma is web browser, so you know you could use that and get the best of both worlds. Does this help translate to actual web dev? Um, basically the prototypes you make here, they help your team so much, like the developers, because it know they'll know going in exactly what they need. They just have to, you know, actually develop it. Whereas if you didn't make the sketches, everybody's working with different ideas of what should happen. Everybody has, you know, different clue. There's no set one set goal, one set way to get things done. That's why these wireframes are important. It's also good for um, basically other members of teams. Like for example, you know, marketers may need this. If for example, you're working on a project trying to get a VC backed, you know, a bunch of times you'll need to show wireframes to the venture capitalists, just as an example. Um, you know, if you're at a, a conference basically and you're wanting to showcase a project, you're not gonna have the actual product there. Maybe you'll have like a sample and the prototype could be one of the ways that you showcase that sample. Uh, but yes, they usually do, a lot of these websites do have ways to like take the design and kind of like embed, uh, give you a, an exported CSS and some have uh, HTML, but uh, I, I personally don't use those that often. Uh, free UI kits use, for Apple, for those interested in iOS dev. Oh, thank you, Kim. Thank you, boss lady. I'm gonna I'm gonna show you guys something actually really helpful. And I'll post it here. Uh, I, I'm not streaming right now. I'm just gonna pull it up. Okay. So if you go here, you know, you just look up uh, Adobe UI kits. Like I said, you can see Jumpstart with UI kits. You can also find more by just googling around. You know, UI kits. And here you can see the basically uh, pre-created you know, UI kits, like I previously mentioned, that have all these components that you can use. Um, let me click one and see which one I'm gonna download. I'm not gonna do Apple, I'll do uh, Bootstrap since I'm on here. Okay, so it's gonna download, you're gonna have to open it up. And all you do is you just extract it and you click on the Adobe link inside the folder that's downloaded and you'll be able to you'll be able to um, use the kit. Uh, let me click. Uh, these are, you know, free assets. You can use them where let me click on. Here we go. Adobe. Okay. So now you can see this is the open project from that downloaded link where you can scroll in. On the left side, you see all the colors that were used and showcased throughout these artboards. You have the character types, the fonts, you know, custom fonts, and the components. These are the pretty big part where, you know, you, if you want it, for example, say I'm working on a project and I just want a button, I can come here, click on, I'll click on form switches, zoom in, and boom, right here. I have a form switch already. I don't have to make it myself. You see, it's very helpful. It gets things done very quickly and it makes it so you don't fully have to worry about having to design every single aspect. So these are good to play around with. You can find more online. If only web dev for it is easy. I feel you, bro. I feel you. But uh, yeah, so any more questions? 
Otherwise, like I said, this is the end of the workshop. If you want, you can dippy dip. I thank you for your time.